There you go, and this is what you look like. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm Martin Rees, I'm from Cambridge University. All right, and uh, what, are you a professional astronomer? Um, yes, I am a professional astronomer, but a theorist more than an observer. Okay, are um, we alone? Um, well, I think we, we don't know that question, and the main uncertainty is biological. The one exciting development in the last decade or two has been the realization that planetary systems are common. Most of the stars we see in the sky are orbited by retinues of planets, like the solar system, and we suspect that there are a billion planets, more or less like the Earth, in our galaxy. But, of course, the difficult question is, does life get started? Because although we understand Darwinian evolution, we don't understand the basic transition from biochemistry to the first replicating, metabolizing systems. And until we understand that, we don't know whether it was a rare fluke or whether it's something that would happen in any similar environments. I'm hopeful, incidentally, that within the next decade or so, people will sort out that question because serious people are working on it for the first time. And I think there's a genuine hope we'll understand the chemistry which led to the first life. And that will tell us two important things. The first is, was it a fluke or would be expected? And second, is the particular biochemistry of DNA, RNA special? Or if there is other life, could it have a different chemical basis? Those are two questions we might understand. But of course, even if we find that simple life is likely to evolve, then it's a separate question how likely it is to evolve, as it has here on Earth, into something that we would call intelligent and complex. And that's very uncertain because uh, evolution biologists differ among themselves about the relative importance of convergence versus contingency in the evolution of life on Earth. So even if it's a simple life, we don't know how likely it is to develop a biosphere. And then, of course, there's the quite separate set of questions which are very complicated, very fascinating, about how we might look for evidence of that life. Yeah, now, in 1995, 1996, there was a debate between Ernst Mayer, a biologist at Harvard, and uh, Carl Sagan. And uh, Ernst Mayer was saying, no, that we should not expect hominids out there, just like G George Gaylord Simpson did. We should not expect hominid or human-like intelligence. And Carl Sagan said, oh, yes, we should. We should expect functionally equivalent homo sapiens. So, and it, it seems to me that in the community there's a dichotomy between astronomers who think, oh, intelligence is so useful that it is, should be a convergent feature of evolution versus the biologists who say, no, every species is unique and what we're talking about here is human specific, a, a species specific characteristic. And so you're a, you're a physicist, you're on the physical chemistry hard science line of that. Biologists kind of say, oh no, they don't know what they're talking about. So. How, how does that uh, play out? I would not see this as a division between astronomers and biologists at all. Mm. Because among the biologists, there's been a big difference. I mean, Stephen Jay Gould believed that uh, our emergence was a contingency. Uh, my colleague Simon Conway Morris believes that uh, there's a convergent process and there will be aliens if there's any life, and they look rather like us. Yes. So he's at one extreme, mm -hmm. and Stephen Jay Gould was the other. So it's, it's really a uh, dispute between the experts. The yeah. astronomers aren't experts. Their opinion is not worth anything on this point. But I think <laughs> the, um, uh, the, the biologists um, are not really agreed because it is a very difficult question. We only have one example, of course. So, the, so, we t so astronomers have done their job in terms of the Drake equation. They found all these Earth-like planets and there's probably water on them. So, you know, so the question then becomes, is there life on these planets? And then the second question, is there intelligent life capable of building either UF, uh, building spaceships or radio telescopes? So well, how do you assess the relative probabilities of A, life emerging, and then B, once you have life, intelligent life? Mm -hmm. Well, I think we are too ignorant to be able to assess any worthwhile probabilities. Um, if you ask me to bet, I would bet that simple life is probably quite common. But even there, uh, all bets are off, really, because it could be we're unique. And I don't think it's sensible in the present state of ignorance to make any probability estimates, even of simple life. Still less is it uh, possible to make any estimates of the probability of complex life. So I just think uh, if we want to consider the worthwhileness of SETI, etc., that even though we've got no idea of how likely it is to exist and whether we could ever detect it, it's worth a try because it's such a fascinating question. So I'm glad that there are efforts to make it, but I think it's absurd 
um, and pretentious to claim to be able to assess probabilities when we are so ignorant about uh, all stages in evolution. And also, of course, even if there is intelligent life, we don't know what the chances are that we'd be able to detect it or recognize it. It might be so different that we can't recognize it. Um, if you ask me for my take on uh, SETI and what it might find, it's the following. Uh, we know something about what's happened on Earth in the last four or four and a half billion years. Uh, we know that uh, um, there was no technological activity for nearly all that time and for the last few centuries there has been technological activity leading to the possibility of sending out signals, going into space, etc. We also suspect that within a century or two humans may be superseded by inorganic intelligence. That inorganic intelligence will not be limited by the restrictions of the hardware in human brains. It may quickly supersede us. And of course, it will not particularly want to be on the Earth because the environment of the Earth that is essential for us um, is suboptimal for um, a advanced robot which may prefer to be under zero G, for instance. So uh, I would guess that uh, even though human beings may survive on the Earth, the advanced intelligences one or two centuries from now will be inorganic materials away from the Earth. And we also know in astronomy that there are billions of years ahead. So the conclusion I would draw if I was laying my bets is that if we detect any SETI, it would not be organic. It'll be some kind of inorganic machines away from a planet. Because if we think of a time chart, then there's been four and a half billion years then this tiny sliver of biologically engineered technology, which we are part of, and that will be superseded by maybe even billions of years of technology um, which does not involve organic stuff at all. And so it's most unlikely that we would catch any AI in the state when it is uh, um, organically controlled, it's far more likely that any AI will be uh, completely inorganic. Some, some machine um, may be sending out a signal or sending out some kind of electromagnetic uh, signals that are manifestly artificial, but may be being sent out by accident and unlikely to be interpretable by us at all. So I would say that if we detect a signal, it'll be from something like that, and it'll be most unlikely to be able to make any sense of it. Well, how about, how about uh, you, you mentioned this biological to technological transition. Mm -hmm. I can imagine that a, even a technological-based extraterrestrial might only last, I don't know, a thousand years or 10,000 or a million years, and after that, maybe something even more abstract that we haven't thought of yet. Right, of course, we can't, we can't predict what will happen, but uh, one can expect that it will uh, um, last longer than the um, biology-based technological civilization, and of course will disperse, because once it got away from the Earth, then there'll be more diversity, and some will develop one way, some will develop other ways. So if there is um, uh, any uh, place in the cosmos where things have got further than they have already on Earth, then I would expect that it'll be very diverse, very spread out. Could you tell us a, a little story about yourself, about how, maybe your youth, about how it is that you became who you are and why an astronomer and why you're interested in this question? Well, I think one doesn't have to be an astronomer to be interested in this question at all, and that's why I think it's important to uh, devote effort to the SETI search, because it's something which I think has more public support than most of the rather arcane topics that we get publicly supported to study if we're astronomers. Um, so it's a fascinating topic which uh, uh, doesn't just interest astronomers. And of course, uh, interest in it goes back to antiquity. Have fact, you personally always found it interesting? What I've always found it interesting, obviously, from the time childhood. Time you were three or four or five? Well, I, I don't know when I started, <laughs> but certainly, certainly I was interested. And uh, I didn't know until I was about 22 that I was going to be an astronomer. Um, and so obviously, um, being uh, fortunate to be a professional astrophysicist, I have uh, seen this as part of uh, the context of trying to understand the universe. But I think it's very important that the biggest uncertainties are biological, not astronomical, mm -hmm. and of course uh, um, involving um, information technology and AI, 
as well as biology, but not astronomy. The astronomy uh, is something which is making great progress. We know there are lots of mm -hmm. planets, and uh, uh, we know that it's quite likely that complex chemistry and biochemistry exists elsewhere. In science, we identify the Copernican Revolution, where the sun became the center, not the Earth, and also, I guess, the Darwinian Revolution, where we realize that we're animals. Do you think that in finding extraterrestrials, it will initiate some type of other revolution that we haven't given a name to yet? Well, it may do. Of course, uh, in a sense, finding these zillions of planetary systems is a kind of Copernican demotion. Mm -hmm. But of course, at the moment, it may still be the case that life is unique to this planet. It could still be the case that despite the vastness of the galaxy and the variety of planets in it, uh, this Earth is uh, the most important part of the galaxy, because it could be only here that life has evolved to the state of intelligence. And if that's the case, it doesn't mean that life is forever a trivial um, afterthought, because uh, if we don't screw things up in the present century, then uh, um, life, and life in quotation marks, which will be mainly, I think, inorganic life, could spread from the Earth through the rest of the galaxy. So the Earth could be the place from which the entire galaxy is seeded with life. So the failure of the SETI search is disappointing for the searchers, but uh, allows us to be less cosmically modest because it allows us to think of the Earth as being a very special place in the galaxy, which it would not be, of course, if it uh, uh, was just one of uh, many places where intelligent life had emerged. So then we could become the stewards of not only the Earth, but the stewards of the galaxy and the local cluster and the entire universe if we well, were alone. Yeah. Uh, well, it could then be that uh, uh, what happens here on Earth, if it goes very badly, is not just a terrestrial but a cosmic disaster. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Now, you, what about the Fermi paradox? I, I don't say, I'm looking around the room, I don't <laughs> see any aliens, so where are mm -hmm. they? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you have a favorite solution to the Perry paradox? Um, I, I, I don't. I think the, there are many. In fact, uh, um, Stephen Webb at the Open University wrote a book with uh, 50 arguments. He has a second edition with 75 arguments. Oh, it's just come up, which I wrote a foreword to. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, so uh, there are many counter arguments. Mm -hmm. um, but it is obviously a constraint on the uh, amount of. Uh, um, advanced intelligence and the way it behaves. But of these 75 or 50, you don't have a favorite or a couple of favorites that you think are more plausible? There are no, many no, plausible no. ones there. No, so. no, but I, but I do think that we've got to be very open-minded. Of course, uh, the ways we are searching are just the ways we're able to search. There may be other ways. And, of course, th there may be intelligence in the form that we can't conceive because another point I would make as a scientist is that um, uh, it's rather remarkable that our brains, which haven't changed since our ancestors roamed the African savanna, have been able to cope not just with the everyday world, which they evolved to cope with, but with the micro world of subatomic particles and with the cosmos. So it's amazing we've understood so much. But the other side of that coin is that there may very well be phenomena, crucial aspects of nature, which are beyond human brains just as quantum mechanics is beyond a chimpanzee. And so I think we should bear in mind that there's no reason to think that we are able to understand or even be aware of the deepest aspects of physical reality. And that's another reason for saying that, uh, uh, bearing in mind that um, there are billions of years ahead and any other civilization might have had a uh, couple of billions of years head start over us, we might have something which existed and we have no conception of at all and no chance of even recognizing. Now you've used the word ahead and so that assumes progress. Now biologists have argued about whether there is any type of progress in biological evolution and there's a strong debate about that but you seem to accept that as far as technology is concerned. Um, well, I mean, I, I think I, I know there's been a sort of sterile debate between Stephen Gould et, et al. about this, um, and, and it, it's true that there is no, uh, um, there's no underlying push towards this, but, uh, but, but it is fairly clear that evolution on the Earth has led to a greater variety of more complex things by kinds of diffusion. I mean, uh, uh, if you have a random walk and you start at the center, then the longer you go on, the further some people will get. So, so uh, um, there's a, an expanding variety, even though the process is, is random and governed by natural selection. So um, I, I, I think in a loose way, one could talk about uh, maybe not progress, but growing complexity.
and so clearly so. there's been a growing complexity in uh, biological evolution and um, in terms of uh, intelligence then uh, if we get to the kind of um, uh, machines which are in effect advanced computers uh, within which signals can be transmitted a million times faster than the neuronal signals in our brain uh, and which are not limited by the meta metabolic constraints of uh, our brains, then I think we may very well um, uh, imagine that there could be some kind of intelligence uh, which is far beyond, in the sense of being able to grasp far more things than we can. I mean, I think one could say in an objective sense that there are limits to uh, what human minds can grasp. Um, I, I could, as a digression, I can give you a, a simple example. Um, if you've done coordinate geometry, uh, and uh, I ask you to visualize um, the shape x squared plus y squared less than 1, you'll think that's a circle of unit radius. If I give you for the algorithm for the Mandelbrot set, I bet you and no human being can immediately visualize that. Mm -hmm. And that's just an example of saying that we can compute things, but we can't visualize them. And so there can be uh, brains with far greater grasp than, than the human brain, and they are the ones that may exist um, out there. And that's progress in a sense. But of course, there is a philosophical question, which uh, if you talk to John Searle at Berkeley and such like comes up, which is um, about consciousness and self-awareness. And um, uh, of course, some people would point out, and it is the case, that you can have a, an apparently intelligent robot which is zombified, uh, and that these creatures will not have an inner life, will not um, have consciousness. Some people would say that, and it's hard to disprove. Others would say that consciousness is an emergent property once you get a sufficiently complex network. And this would uh, imply that uh, these advanced machines would have consciousness. And I think it is important in determining people's attitude to it. I wrote an article uh, quite recently in a newspaper um, when I made the point that I thought that uh, um, advanced inorgan inorganic brains would take over from humans. Um, and I presented, presented this as a positive development because they will have far more uh, co deeper cogitation than we do, etc., etc. I regard this as positive. Um, but some readers assumed that uh, uh, these things would inevitably be, be zombies, they would have no internal thoughts, etc. And indeed, it would then be disappointing if uh, there was no self awareness in the universe. So I think one's attitude towards uh, this particular scenario, which I favor, depends very much on if you're sort of hard Surlian, who thinks that consciousness is special to the type of hardware in human skulls, mm -hmm. or if you think that consciousness is an emerging property, in which case these uh, um, uh, machines could have a lot more of it than we have. Now, you've mentioned the word intelligence quite a few times, and consciousness, and a bio these things are come from your brain and our brains. Mm -hmm. Now, a biologist would say that your brain is there to keep you alive. No matter what it does, the only function of it is to keep you alive. Mm -hmm. And if it keeps you alive, then it's done as just like a liver. Mm -hmm. If it keeps you alive, it's doing what it should be. And if it doesn't, it will get selected out and, and mm -hmm. you will die. Yes. So survival is the own, not intelligence, seems to be the biological criteria for judging the success of something. So self-destruction mm -hmm. seems to be not uncorrelated with the intelligence and the progress and consciousness, you know, a lot of suicides are being committed because people think some crazy things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, um, so, what, so if using that biological criteria, uh, well, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm lost here. Uh, <laughs> if we kill ourselves because of this technological progress, then that's kind of stupid. So in other words, if, if we're so smart that we kill ourselves, then we really are stupid by at least a d biological definition. So mm -hmm. you could say we're getting increasingly stupid rather than increasingly smart. So that would be not progress, that would be stupidity and anti-progress in a Darwinian sense. So what do you think of that? Um, well, of course, uh, we know that humans are vulnerable. I've written a lot about the problems we are facing in this century from the uh, more powerful technologies and the greater impact of humans on the environments, the greater empowerment of small groups, etc. So we are vulnerable. Um, but I think the important point that people often don't realize is that biological selection and Darwinian selection is now irrelevant because uh, um, we, uh, um, we, we keep human beings alive even if they wouldn't survive in the wild. But more important, future evolution 
is going to happen not on the timescale of the Darwinian selection, but on the much shorter timescale of technological advance. So, uh, the so is that more dangerous then? Yes, more, more well, we don't know. Uh, it, it, it depends. But um, uh, within a few centuries, I think there will be post-humans away from the Earth. I mean, if we think of uh, what may happen, um, there, there may be machines that will go away from the Earth, advanced robotic fabricators. Uh, if humans go away from the Earth to establish colonies on asteroids, they will be, or on Mars, then um, th they'll be sort of um, crazy pioneers, etc. And whatever constraints we impose on Earth, on um, uh, cyborg and genetic modification techniques, we surely wish those pioneers out there good luck in modifying themselves in whatever way they can to adapt to that alien environment. And so within a few generations, within a, a few centuries at most, then any descendants of us living elsewhere in the solar system Hmm. will be post-humans. They'll be different from us. They'll have engineered themselves to adapt to an alien environment. And then, of course, uh, if we think of what may happen beyond that, um, uh, interstellar travel is no challenge if you live for a million years, although it is a challenge for humans. So interstellar travel is a post-human venture, hmm. uh, although, of course, it may well be that uh, um, uh, the only interstellar transmission will be of uh, electromagnetic waves or maybe of uh, DNA or messages of that kind. But I think the very important point is that future evolution is going to be not Darwinian selection, it's going to be technological. Hmm. And I, I guess there, the, in, in colonizing the galaxy or moving to other planets, you have biological support for that being a smart thing to do because biogeography tells us that the more diverse places the uh, uh, species lives, the more insured that it is that it won't go extinct. Well, and that's a generic thing which applies to, uh, to machines as well as that's to right. biological that's organisms. Right. Right. And so that's why I think one, uh, once uh, uh, intelligence starts to spread from the Earth, then even if it is now unique to the Earth, then it has a bright future somewhere in the galaxy. Right. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen a UFO? No. <laughs> have you ever been abducted by an alien? No, but of course I've met people who have been abducted, um, and, uh, uh, and I get lots of letters from such people, and um, uh, I say two things to the writers of those letters. I say first, do they really think that if these aliens had made the huge technical effort to divert interstellar space and come here, would they just make a few corn circles, meet one or two well-known cranks and go away again? That seems unlikely to me. And the second thing I say is that these people should write letters to each other and not to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Um, let's see. How about unusual ideas? You know, Feynman once said there's a lot of room at the bottom. And I'm wondering about uh, Maybe there are micro aliens that we, you know, the Fermi paradox. One solution might be, well, they are here, but they're just microscopic or nano on the nano scale. Mm -hmm. Is that a possibility? You think? Or? I think that's possible because I think if we think of the uh, uh, the amount of complexity in an insect's brain or a bee's brain or something like that, we realize that there is a long way to go uh, from uh, even the most miniaturized uh, um, hardware we have in our iPhones. And if you realize how much progress we've made in that direction by comparing an iPhone with something 20 years ago, then we realize there's a long way to go. And the question is whether we will get as far as, um, uh, as, as um, the real nanotechnology. Um, but of course, it could have happened elsewhere. So it's perfectly, I don't know what the constraints are, but clearly you could have something which has the complexity of a human brain and is very, very much smaller. How about how about, uh, have you thought of some, cra or heard of some crazy ideas that you thought, whoa, that's a kind of a crazy idea about an alien. I wonder if that's true. And then, I don't know, made you laugh. It's kind of like the Nobel Prize, you know, an idea that mm -hmm. first makes you laugh and then makes you think. Have you had any experiences like that with ideas about aliens? Well, I tend to think that people um, are not imaginative enough. I mean, I think they, of course, in all the movies, they tend to draw these bipeds, you know, which look mm -hmm. a bit like us, and there's no reason for that. But also, I think the um, fact that people talk about civilizations is also perhaps too anthropocentric, because that implies a society of individual beings, etc., which is mm -hmm. what, what we have on the, on the Earth and what, in a sense, some animal species had. But, of course, uh, that may not be what we would find. It could be sort of one single organized entity 
one single consciousness. And so to talk about a civilization is, I think, perhaps too restrictive if we think of all the possible things that might be out there. Well, for example, so uh, <coughs> you could, instead of looking for aliens, you could look for the <coughs> alien, the multicellular <coughs> analog of, uh, I guess, Google. Yes, certainly. It could be one very, very complex uh, system, indeed. Okay. Um, how about what, what do you think are the most, un, un, uh, the most common misconceptions that students who will be taking this course might have about the connection <coughs> between the scientific view of how we got here and are we alone? Well, I think there's the um, uh, popular fallacy saying that uh, um, because life evolved on Earth, it must be common. Uh, not realizing that we are only here because it's the place where life evolved and it's entirely logically possible that the Earth is the only place where life evolved. Mm -hmm. And people uh, tend to somehow make the assumption mm -hmm. that because life evolved on Earth, um, it must be common. And that's an obvious fallacy, and many people fall into that trap right at the beginning. Doesn't it remind you of the cosmological uh, principle where we assume that our part of the universe is average? Um, well, it, it, uh, it does, but, but there, there we have evidence that it is average. <laughs> uh, here, uh, the whole point of SETI is to see what the evidence is. We've got no evidence at the moment um, uh, about whether life is unique or not. So we're trying to uh, estimate how quirky something is. And for example, you said, well, we could look for life out there and intelligent life, but how about life that's speaking English or Japanese people who are speaking English out there or Indian elephants? How about that seem, is that more quirky than intelligent life? Well, I think um, uh, the most likely thing we would find if a SETI search found anything positive would be something that was manifestly not natural and astrophysical. And uh, obviously, we astrophysicists would have to use our imagination to make sure it couldn't be natural. Um, you know, some, some funny, uh, very, very narrow bandwidth signal or something like that. Well, let me, let me interrupt yeah. you there mm -hmm. for a second, because, yeah. you know, Car Arthur C. Clarke said that, you know, any sufficiently advanced civilization mm -hmm. will be indistinguishable from magic. Yes, yes. And then Carl Schroeder says that any sufficiently advanced civilization will be indistinguishable from nature. Mm -hmm. And so I, th I heard that just a couple of weeks ago, and yes. I thought, oh, that's an interesting idea. And essentially, yes. and that essentially undercuts or un undermines our not possibly naive assumption that any signal will be recognizable, distinguishable from nature. So, but mm. that means, oh, you know, like that suggests that, oh, the aliens have, are so advanced that they are equivalent mm. to nature kind of thing. Yes, yes. Well, well, I mean, it's certainly true that uh, um, one shouldn't look for a sort of uh, um, AM radio signal or something like that. Um, I and, love Lucy. Yes, uh, and indeed, it, it's also, it, um, it's also true that uh, um, uh, the, the aim of, uh, um, uh, of, of, of image compression and message compression is to remove redundancy. And the more successful you are in compressing a message, mm -hmm. the more similar it is to noise. Right. Because uh, if it's not like noise, then you haven't done the optimum job. Well, this so, is Carl Sagan's argument about why we should look for aliens possibly in the digits of pi. Yes, I'm it's not a sure. random sequence which would contain all of the information that you could possibly want. Well, it contains the Bible and the Quran as well. <laughs> that's right. Exactly. So, uh, exactly. Yes. so I, I don't think uh, I don't think that's a very good idea. Um, but but I think the, the important point is that um, it may indeed be hard to uh, um, convince oneself that something can't be natural. Um, that we uh, and, and that. And so that, that's why um, um, absence of evidence isn't evidence of absence, to quote the old saying. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, so we've always got to look for something which um, everyone would agree couldn't arise naturally and uh, some kind of narrow band signal or some, some sort of uh, laser type of effect might, might be a good candidate. But of course, um, what we're doing is we're looking by the techniques that we already have developed. There may be other techniques that would be um, more advantageous, um, but we've no idea what we're looking for. But I think it's very important that it's far, um, it's unlikely we'll detect anything, but it's far more unlikely that we detect something that we can decode. So, so there seems to be a, we talk about an abiotic signal, and then we talk about a biotic signal, yes, and then we yeah. talk about, I guess, when we use the word artificial, we tend to imply, oh, it's a, a signal created by an intelligent species. So yes. we have uh, essentially divided all of nature into non-life 
uh, I guess, non-human life, the mm -hmm. signals that, for example, birds make nests, yeah, yeah, and yeah. you find a bird's nest, that's, yes, yes. is that a natural signal or is that mm -hmm. an mm -hmm. artificial one? You can say, mm -hmm. well, maybe. But mm -hmm. then if you find a you know, beep, 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 SOS, that's an intelligent signal. Mm -hmm. So we divide things into three there. Mm -hmm. And in some sense, we've created a pre-Darwinian world in which signals come from non-humans and humans. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a, a division that I guess I'm uncomfortable with. How about you? Well, it depends what we're looking for. I mean, to, to, to find some bird song from space would be very exciting, wouldn't it? Uh, so in, in anything that could not be explained by straight physics would be in, exciting, even though it may not be intelligence. Um, but I think the important point is that uh, um, the kind of intelligence um, from an entity which we would say understood all the um, maths, physics, and astronomy we understand, mm -hmm. uh, that could be something which is organic, like us or it could be something which is a machine. Now physicists tend to think, and Carl Sagan, and possibly you yourself, you think that math would be a good language to talk to the aliens with. On the other hand, some more, I guess, uh, humanities-based people think that they should, we should use the sp different species on Earth and try to communicate with them, and they seem to react more to either touch or music, mm -hmm. not math. If you talk to a horse in math, it's not going to go very mm -hmm. far, or, or dolphins, but some people play music for the dolphins. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, what do you think of the language that we should use based on the, an the alien analogs we have here, you would think that maybe music would be a better way to communicate rather than math? Well, I mean, uh, I think the idea of communication is something that's barely worth thinking about at the moment. Because uh, uh, as we know, even if we detect something, mm -hmm. uh, then uh, um, uh, a two-way message is going to be decades at the very least, mm -hmm. and probably much more so, uh, no snappy repartee mm -hmm. and plenty of time to think of a signal to send. Uh, so, um, uh, and of course, we have no idea about it. Um, of course, uh, it's traditionally been said that um, the most, if the aliens wanted to uh, send out a beacon that was manifestly artificial, then the digit of pi or a set of prime numbers would be the obvious thing to send out. But of course, uh, uh, there may be intelligence who don't recognize that. But I think um, uh, even if they're on planet Zog with seven tentacles, they're likely to, uh, um, where they look out on the same universe, if they got eyes, so they would share with us something. They'd, they'd be in the same cosmos, and they'd share something about physics and maths. And then if you ask, what would they like to know about us if they were interested? Then certainly not our physics, maths, and astronomy. They'd know all that. Um, but I think what they would want to know about is maybe about our society, but also probably about um, all the living organisms swimming in the sea, etc., because they would understand Darwinian uh, principles, but um, th they would not be able to predict, for first principles, um, the uh, details of our biosphere. And so if you want to send any message, we send them, uh, uh, um, well, if you don't send all the internet, we should send them all the details of all the species of, uh, of animals and fish. So you think they'd be the, uh, the cultural anthropologist aliens are the ones that would be most interested in us, not the, the physicist aliens who will already know everything that we know. Absolutely, about. absolutely, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, how about advice for students about thinking about this issue of are we alone? There are a lot of crazy thoughts out there. If you probably Google are we alone, they'll find all kinds of mm -hmm. stuff that you probably don't think makes sense. Mm -hmm. What Can you give some advice to these students taking this course? Well, of course, it's a wonderful topic because it does fascinate everyone. And, uh, of course, um, it could be set in a historical context because um, people from the 17th century onwards were, of course, much more open-minded about the idea of, of aliens. They thought the planets were inhabited in the uh, 17th century. Herschel thought the sun was inhabited. Mm -hmm. And, of course, uh, in the 19th century, people thought Mars was inhabited. Um, and um, uh, there was no argument against it. And, of course, some of their reasoning was um, uh, because they thought it was all created by God and it's such a waste of space if it's not all inhabited. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's a wonderful quote I found from uh, Brewster, the Brewster Angle, who says that the moon must be inhabited because um, uh, uh, if it was merely put there by God to illuminate the earth, why did it have all these wonderful mountains and craters? <laughs> a piece of chalk would suffice. And uh, so uh, that was the idea. And oh. it was therefore um, uh, disappointing when 
uh, it was raised in the 20th century, the, how sterile and hostile to life the planets were. And so the subject is now revived now that we um, have this huge expansion in our knowledge of the universe through uh, realizing that our solar system is one of literally billions in our galaxy. Uh, and so that's op opened up the subject. And uh, I think that, that makes it more fascinating now. Um, and I would say that um, thinking about aliens is an add-on to biology um, because the origin of life is a serious subject. Even the most earthbound biologists would like to know the origin of life, which is still a mystery the transition from biochemistry to metabolizing, replicating systems. So um, as a byproduct of learning about that key question in biology, uh, one will learn how likely it is that it evolved elsewhere, um, how many other ways chemically could it have happened, etc. And also if we're working on exoplanets, which is a serious part of um, astronomy, which is the area I most encourage young people to go into if they are choosing an area of astronomy, uh, then uh, obviously uh, looking for habitable planets um, is uh, exciting. Although incidentally, um, the focus on Earth-like planets makes sense because that's the first place to look. But science fiction writers have of course reminded us that uh, life could exist in other places, you know, creatures floating in the atmosphere of a Jupiter-like planet or indeed um, uh, objects um, uh, in interstellar space. We don't know. So we shouldn't focus only on Earth-like planets, though it's the obvious place to start. Well, if you made the prediction that, uh, not, and not only yourself, but that we will become transhuman and inorganic. Yes. And so where, how would you, could you, def if you're an inorganic life form, you don't need water and you right. don't need, but, but you do need free energy. So where's yes. the habitable zone of inorganic life in the universe? Um, well, it's free floating in outer space, but you'd probably need, you still need energy, so you're either taking some yes. plutonium with you or you're yes. using the photons from a star? Or? Well, I, I, either of those two. I mean, either, either you have to be not too far from a star um, or you have to have your own source of energy. But uh, certainly you don't need to stick to an Earth-like environment. <laughs> okay. And indeed, uh, um, a, a, a large uh, uh, construct um, that, that's inorganic may not want to be in strong gravity anyway. And indeed, if we look at the nearer term, I mean, I think that within 50 years, what's going to happen is that um, uh, there'll be large robotic fabricators in space making very large gossamer thin mirrors and things of that kind assembled up there and maybe mining materials from the moon or asteroids to build them. So large construction projects in space are the kind of things that we can envisage within this century. Well, how about if there are, let's do a bit, of, a bit more wild, how about if there are other spatial dimensions and you're able to move into these spatial dimensions mm. or maybe you can control the nature of the vacuum and maybe vacuum fluctuations are in some sense uh, aliens talking or something. What, mm -hmm. what are those, those are crazy ideas. What do you think of those? Well, of course, there are uh, certainly ideas that uh, um, are uh, space-time volume that we live in may not be all the physical reality. The idea of the multiverse, um, multiple big bangs in the eternal inflation theory, or the idea that um, uh, um, there are lots of three-dimensional um, spaces embedded in a in a fourth spatial dimension, um, and um, uh, there may be another universe just that far away from us. But if that distance is measured in the fourth spatial dimension, we're imprisoned in our three, mm -hmm. we won't know about it, just like you could imagine population of ants on a two-dimensional surface, their universe being unaware of another population on a parallel surface. So lots of ideas like that. And this is just an instance of a, a point um, that I would reiterate, which is that um, there may well be um, aspects of physical reality that we are not yet aware of in our physics um, and which maybe we'll discover, or which may be beyond the capacity of human brains to discover. We should be open-minded about both those options. Now you seem to, like many astrophysicists, seem to be very rational, and, um, but you also, hope so. you mm. also dream, though, and you have an emotional side. And I'm wondering if you have you dreamed about aliens? Because a lot of people who are not physicists are just not that rational, and they like to think about these things in more emotional terms and more irrational terms. And so that's not necessarily a bad thing. And presumably you've had dreams about, I don't know, aliens. Have you ever dreamt about aliens? Do you? I don't think so, no. You don't think so? No. <laughs> no. Mm -hmm. Well, how about you? I've dreamt about very strange people, but I wouldn't call them <laughs> aliens. Mm -hmm. But as a scientist, mm -hmm. you are trained to become a 
more aware of what you want to believe about something and then you're on your, you warn yourself, oh, this is what I want, so let's not rush too quickly mm -hmm. into that direction. Mm -hmm. And the search for aliens is, is uh, infamous for us looking for ourselves. I, I think mm -hmm. in Jules Verne's time, the people who saw UFOs saw, instead of flying spaceships, they saw flying galleons. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, yes, yes. So, um, so I'm wondering how guilty are we of doing that and can we, how do we undo that? either emotionally or rationally? Um, well, of course, another important dictum is extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Mm -hmm. And so we will need very strong evidence to uh, um, believe credibly that we have discovered an alien because to, it is so but important. To, but to evaluate extraordinary, some people think, oh, that's what I want to believe, therefore it's not extraordinary. And if you're unaware of what you want to believe, then you easily yes. think that's, that's not extraordinary at all. Yes, yes, yes. But, but of course, uh, um, it's not clear what people want because uh, uh, I'm not sure I want aliens to exist because I might be equally happy. It would be duller <laughs> in the universe, but it would make the Earth more cosmically important. And so you, you can be less cosmically modest if you are unique. And so uh, I'm ambivalent. I, it's worth the search, but uh, I won't be disappointed either way. So, okay. <laughs> so you're, you're a, so I've I, got no bias. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, how about if we did find aliens, we had a verifiable artificial signal tomorrow from mm. a telescope, what, how would that change your worldview? Or would you go out and dance, for example, or would you laugh, would you cry? I was talking to Jill Tarter yesterday, and she yes. thought they saw something for about 12 hours, mm -hmm. and then when they found out it was just the Soho satellite, mm -hmm. they started to cry, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they'd been so excited, yes, and then yes, they were yes. so disappointed. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it, it would be the most important discovery in our lifetime, there's no doubt about that. Um, and uh, um, uh, as a discovery, you know, one would be extremely excited, there's no doubt about that. But that's all, excitement, then the next day, uh, nothing? Uh, surely it must... Uh, well, it would remain uh, in your consciousness. It would remain it? in our consciousness. Yes, well, absolutely. they said that about the picture of the Earth from far away. Yeah, you know, yeah. that, and that has remained in our yes, consciousness. Yes, but yes. when it first came out, it was very, whoa. Absolutely. But now it's kind of sunk in a little bit, and we kind of take it for granted that, yes, we're, the Earth is a spaceship that we should try to take care yeah, of. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. And how, but what type of implications will the discovery of an alien civilization from, I don't know, a star 20 light years away do? Well, it will have. I mean, of course, you, you mentioned the impact of the Apollo 8 photographs. And, you know, I never look at the moon without thinking of Neil Armstrong now, mm -hmm. you know. So it, it, it has affected my consciousness. Um, but I, th I suppose the point about uh, any detection of, of, uh, of life, uh, then um, it would be hugely important anyway. Um, and I think many of us will want to focus on what we can do to follow it up. Um, you know, how, how can we test it more? What's the next thing to do? Should we look in other places, uh, et, et cetera? And so I, I think all of us, um, whether we're astronomers or not, uh, would modify our research programs to uh, take it into account because following up on it um, would clearly be a, a top priority in science and that would be accepted as such. Your comment about you have no bias, does that mean that as the head of an oversight committee of a $100 million program, you don't care one way or the other whether it succeeds or not? Well, I'd be very, <laughs> I'd be very excited indeed if it did succeed. Mm. <laughs> yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you would be excited if it didn't? Well, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, be, uh, I wouldn't be too personally depressed. I mean, obviously, um, uh, I would feel sorry because obviously those people who put effort into something uh, want, to, want to get a result. We all want to get a result. But of course, um, thinking as a sort of human being, uh, then uh, some people would see it as a human demotion. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and probably some religious people would anyway. All right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Uh, I think that's, we've done, we've covered quite a bit. Uh, any last parting? Well, let me ask you again. Are we alone? Mm -hmm. I think we don't know enough to even put probabilities on that question, but the exciting thing is that we are following up lots of observations and theories which are helping to pin down the uncertainties, and we are using new techniques that will take us nearer the answer, because I think it's the topic which fascinates a wider set of people than almost any other scientific question.